All right, it's um, time to start. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our today's session of the, the lecture series, 10 years after the Arab Spring, protest cycles in the Middle East and North Africa in context. Today's session is um, dedicated to the case of Iran, a non-Arab country. Uh, this is the second in a series of um, three non-Arab countries that we are um, discussing in this series to give a broader context of um, mass mobilization and protest movements in countries of the Middle East to ask about possible points of comparison and entanglements um, between the Arab uprisings um, in 2011 and after and um, countries like Turkey or Iran and Israel. Um, the lecture series is um, co-convened by the University of Hamburg, by the German Institute of Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, um, as well as the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Hamburg and the Academy in Exile, a program for scholars at risk located at um, the Freie Universität Berlin, amongst others. My name is Achim Rode, and I'm very happy to um, welcome our distinguished guest speakers for today. And I would like to just shortly present um, the chair of today's session, Dr. Sara Bazubandi, um, who did her PhD in political, Middle East political economy at the University of Exeter, and then worked in various functions um, for instance, at the Middle East Institute at the National University in Singapore, and um, as a lecturer and senior lecturer at the Internet uh, at Regents University in London. Um, since 2020, she, she had been associated with the Giga Institute in Hamburg, where since early this year, she has um, been awarded the Marie Curie Research Fellowship at the Giga with a project entitled Diversification and Economic Resilience in Iran. So she's very well placed to um, chair today's session on Iran. And without further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to you, Sarah, and good luck for everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my honor to uh, convene this session. I would like to just start with few sentences before I introduce our first speaker and hand in uh, the floor to her. Uh, since late 2010, the Middle East and North Africa region has experienced mass public protests, revolutions and various forms of societal upheavals against incumbent regimes. The common response uh, to such experiences has largely been um, authoritarian upgrading or reconsolid reconsolidation as opposed to democratization that was mainly desired by the people. A, a recent study by Professor Oliver Schlumberger titled um, Puzzles of Political Change in the Middle East found that 70% of the countries uh, in the MENA region, in the Middle East, North Africa region, have experienced authoritarian resilience or reconsolidation over the last decade, whereas a change of political regime occurred only in 27% of the cases. Iran has not been an ex exception in this pattern. Over the past decade, the country has gone through several cycles of unrest caused by a combination of economic and political factors, such as inequality, inflation, unemployment, poverty, uh, political suppression, and violation of human rights. Uh, today, we have two distinguished um, speakers, Dr. Azad Zamiri Rad and Dr. Ahmad Muradi. Thank you both uh, for your time, and it's great to have you here. Uh, Azad and Ahmad will review the past events in Iran um, and uh, try to draw some parallels uh, between the Iranian experience and other countries across the region. Um, and uh, they will assess the prospect of change in Iran, particularly in the light of upcoming presidential election and the ongoing negotiations on the possible return to the nuclear deal that is um, aiming to reconnect Iran to the global community, at least at the economic level. Our first speaker, Azadeh, is um, the deputy head of the Africa and Middle East Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. She has conducted extensive research and policy advisory projects on various aspects of Iranian politics and broad 
broader MENA region. She received a PhD from University of Potsdam and was previously editor of the International Affairs Journal, World uh, Trends, and a lecturer at Potsdam University. Welcome, Azadeh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sora. Thank you, Achim, and thank you to the organizers for setting up such an interesting series. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I was asked to talk about protests, obviously, in Iran and protest cycles in Iran, and I will try to do that in three broad parts. Uh, I will mainly be focusing on the mass protests since 2009, uh, comparing them, looking at differences, and trying to draw some comparisons also wherever I can with the Arab Spring. In the second part, I will look at the state's response, so the toolbox that the Islamic Republic has at its disposal to um, counter these kind of protests and actions. And lastly, very shortly, if I have time, we will see. Um, if not, we can pick that up in the discussion. I will look at other forms of protests that also exist in Iran, forms that are a little bit more subtle, a little bit less visible, non-movements that have actually shaped uh, to a significant degree, as I believe, also the social sphere in Iran. Now, I will not um, have a PowerPoint presentation per se, but I have one or two slides that I want to use it just as visual aid, so it's going to be a little bit easier maybe for you to follow. So I hope you can see everything now, starting with the first protest, the Green Movement, the so-called Green Movement of 2009, when we saw after the highly controversial presidential elections, the re-election of then President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, outrage in the population with about 3 million people taking to the streets. To this state, this is the biggest, largest mass protest that we have seen in Iran. The ones that actually brought the system to the brink of collapse. We haven't seen that with recent round of, uh, rounds of protests. Um, and they were very clearly um, about election fraud. And this is, we're talking about 16 months before the Arab Spring started, when we had these kind of mass protests in Iran. It took a while before we saw the next round of really heavy protests in Iran, uh, December 2017 till about January of 2018, after a governmental budget proposal uh, revealed that there would be significant cuts to fuel and cash subsidies, which would heavily affect uh, particularly low income households. And again, the outrage was, was pretty big. We had um, anti-governmental protests starting in Mashhad in the northeastern part of the Islamic Rep Republic that spread like wildfire, uh, originally kind of organized by the conservative camp, but totally gotten out of control, spreading to over 80 cities in Iran. So these have been the most widespread protests that we have seen. We didn't see millions of people on the streets, but tens of thousands of people on the streets. And only shortly after we saw the November protests, uh, November 2019, uh, that also spilled over in part to 2020 after there was announcements, overnight announcements basically by the government um, of fuel prices that would be increasing. Um, again, we had a severe outrage here, uh, quite violent. We had attacks on police stations, even on oil facilities, on banks, and we saw the most violent crackdown on protesters with hundreds of people um, killed and um, thousands of people imprisoned. Uh, this was by far the most violent crackdown that, we, crackdown that we've seen today. Now, talking about the underlying causes of these kind of protests, Sara already indicated uh, some of them. They are very similar to the kind of causes that we saw in the Arab Spring and that we see in a lot of authoritarian frameworks, um, a number of them being uh, socio-political grievances and a number of them being economic grievances, including widespread corruption, um, mismanagement, nepotism, high unemployment rates that particularly target the youth, which is uh, very much educated and highly qualified in the Islamic Republic, but uh, either underemployed or unemployed with very little perspective uh, looking forward with high inflation, explosion of costs of food and fuel, and of course, the lack of freedoms, ongoing repression, human rights violations, and the general um, unresponsiveness, basically, of the state to public demands and concerns. Now, the question is, with all these underlying causes that are present there, that have been present in 2009 before and still today, under what circumstances really do these protests occur? When do these grievances turn into outrage and this kind of 
discontent, public discontent. And I think when we look at the Islamic Republic in particular, we see that we often find these kind of protests at times when there's a severe clash between public anticipation and actual political outcome. And this is very visible with regard to the Green Movement of 2009. If you look back, there was actually quite a lot of excitement about the elections back then. Um, people were electrified. There was heavy mobilization um, going in before the elections. We saw live debates uh, on television of these candidates that attacked each other quite personally, attacked each other and accused each other of corruption and nepotism openly for everyone to see in live discussions, which cannot could be censored. We saw YouTube and Facebook being allowed to run and a lot of these candidates using them for their campaigns quite heavily. We saw people like Mir Hussein Musavi becoming the front runner of on the reformist ticket basically um, filling whole stadiums of people electrified by the kind of campaign promises, people wearing green as the color of his campaign um, and having this kind of feeling that there was a real hope after four years of hardline policies on the Ahmadinejad that there would be some sort of change. And in fact, in fact, many, many Iranians expected Musavi to actually win. So the announcement um, of his victory and that he had not only won uh, according to official numbers, but by almost two thirds of the votes and the quite heavy irregularities sparked a lot of outrage. And you had this very severe clash of what had been anticipated and what the outcome was. And you see a similar kind of clash of expectations and outcomes in the nationwide protests of 2017. Here we have a clash of economic expectations with the actual policies of the state. The Iranian population were actually heavily relying on the Rouhani government to significantly improve their lives. which was hailed as opening the path for fast economic recovery. But more than two and a half years later, none of these promises actually materialized. And you will find in most of those, or a large number of those more than 80 cities where we later saw these kind of outbursts, that a lot of demonstrations, sit-ins, teacher strikes, bus drivers striking, um, and labor uh, workers uh, um, demonstrating we saw that a lot of these places already had these kind of demonstrations and strikes in place. So when these protests actually erupted, they fell on very fruitful ground. There already um, had been a lot of discontent brewing in these areas for quite some time. And if we move to the November protests, you will see that with the fuel prices increasing even more heavily, it became more and more evident to the Iranian population that not only would their economic situation not improve, it was actually getting worse. And here, of course, economic sanctions and US sanctions made the situation even more tense, and more problematic um, for the Iranian people. Now, what are some of the differences between these kind of protests that we saw? I think we see quite significant differences between the Green Movement of 2009 and what followed later on. The Green Movement had clear leadership with uh, Musavi, a candidate who didn't accept the, the election results, and other people, candidates like Karubi. You had clear goals and a common kind of cause here, that is to overturn what, what was essentially seen as an election fraud and to rectify this kind of situation. We do not have this kind of leadership in later protests. You don't have clear leaders. You had much more diverse um, set of demands and causes being on the streets. You had monarchists being on the streets. You had people who were concerned about their paycheck that hadn't come in. You had people who wanted to overthrow the entire system. So you had this melange of people coming together with no clear structure, no clear cause, and no clear leading figures which makes it, of course, much more difficult also for an autocratic state to co-opt them or to, to push back on, on these kind of movements. Now, another significant difference was that in 2009, you had largely the middle class being actively involved in these kind of protests. A lot of students, academics, people of middle class, also middle class background. Whereas in the later protests, you have largely low income uh, parts of the population taking to the streets. And the middle class was to a, to a large degree absent from these kind of protests. I think it's one of the differences that we see with parts of the Arab Spring that we didn't see in Iran so far, at least these cross-class 
cooperations on 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 actually demonstrations taking place or this cross class solidarity that might be needed for certain more broader um, transformations. Now, what other differences do we see? I think a significant one is that the protests of the recent times since 2017 were essentially decoupled from Iran's factional sphere. Compare that to 2009 when the reformist faction was not only an integral part of the protest, it was in fact leading it. And in later protests, we see not only a disconnect to the factions, they were not only unfactional, in a lot of areas, they were even anti-factional. So you can clearly see a progression also of radicalization when it came to demands and certain causes that show a certain distancing of the Iranian population in terms of protesters between them and the state. In 2009, you still had people trying to move for reform, to work with people within the state to make things better. You see that largely absent in today's protests now, and much more frequently you hear calls for regime change, call for, calls for the system to collapse, and calls for the Supreme Leader to either resign or um, basically calling uh, for his death. So how did the state respond to all of it? Um, I think one of the significant differences, again, that we see in Iran, between Iran and maybe a state like Egypt, for instance, in the Arab Spring, is the quite rapid response that we saw in Iran being taken place um, when it came to information control and control of the cyberspace. Um, Almost immediately after the announcement of the election victory of Ahmadinejad in 2005, the internet was blocked for around 45 minutes. Internet sites were filtered. Foreign media sites access were blocked and they were essentially targeted. Reformist media was shut down. Um, they went after key strategists of the reformist camp, arresting them. They only later in February of 2011 went after the leaders of the movement and put them under house arrest and they remain under house arrest until today. They've also used a set of other very common, I think, tactics that we've seen applied in the Arab Spring, one of which being the delegitimization, of course, of protesters, calling them seditionists, uh, calling them agents of, of foreign kind of uh, foreign actors. Um, deterrence and repression, another very common um, tool of, of autocratic systems to use, deterrence in particular when news came out of mass torture during the uh, Green Movement of 2009 that had a quite intimidating effect on protesters. Positioning snipers on streets and squares and having paramilitary be present there. One area where I think the Islamic Republic certainly benefited where other states during the Arab Spring did not have maybe that much of backing is the area of military and particularly paramilitary support, where the military leadership um, did not really take the side of the protesters. And in some areas, even beyond that, the Islamic Republic could rest on part of the civilian kind of um, part of the revolutionary guards, namely the Basij, ordinary kind of civilian parts of, of these paramilitaries to crack down on protesters as well. And I think Ahmad will tell us a little bit more about the Basij in, in his presentation. Um, so you had a very strong, if you will, response and a very clear signaling right from the start during all these protests from the uh, part of the state that they were determined to crack down on these protests and they were determined to, to hold on and they had the means of power and of violence in their hand to, to do so. So control of the street and fast control of the street was very important here. What we saw in the aftermath, particularly of 2009, um, a number of other, I think, uh, approaches that the state took, but I just want to stress one of them, was heavy investment in producing and creating a national internet, national information framework, um, network, a digital space and of essentially full control of the state, which allowed them in November 2019, for instance, to shut down the internet nationwide for a whole week, which is a huge, huge progress in terms of what they could do in their capacities compared to what they were able to do in 2009. So they have, you know, learned from some of the lessons and have an even firmer grip on part of cybersecurity, uh, part of the um, cyberspace and on the streets. So while the state has been quite let's say effective in a number of areas when it came to these kind of protests, it has been less effective 
when it comes to other forms of protest. But since I'm already running out of time, I will have to leave that for the discussion where we can talk about non-movements also in Iran, where protest is not just about taking to the streets and protesting, but there are more everyday occurrences of, occurrences of how change is being managed in Iran. So let me just sum up that I think even from the very surface level that I have been presenting here due to very limited time, you can see quite the vitality of the public space, uh, space in Iran, um, the potential for mass protests in Iran. We even see way more frequent protest protests nowadays, way more radical in their slogans, much more disconnected from the factional sphere and thus the state. Um, protests that are essentially um, also a sign for the lack of mobilization capacities of the state at this point. And I think we will see that reflected in the upcoming elections, where I think we will have probably a historic low, historically low turnout. And we can talk about the discussions a little bit more in the, about the elections a little bit more in the discussion. Um, but particularly since there's no functioning reformist camp anymore, after all that we've seen since 2009, the state has essentially lost also its ca capacity to um, for co-optation uh, when it comes to these kind of, of factions. So I'm expecting further radicalization and I'm expecting um, that we're heading towards an even bigger rift between society and state. We will have more frequent protests. We will have already the, the time span is shorter between the kind of protests. And what we haven't seen so far is the kind of cooperation between different social classes in Iran, which might occur at a different time. But I think what we have seen and what is an important departure and what will drive these elections also is that people have essentially, a large part of the people have given up on the idea that there could be change within the framework of the system, managed through reformists as a political faction. They've essentially given up on that large parts of what used to be the voter base and mobilization base, particularly of the reformist camp. And this will be clearly reflected in the upcoming elections. So I expect that likely to be many more protests, much more rather than less in the future. Thank you very much, Azadeh. Um, you have presented a very useful and quite detailed picture of the ongoing social structure against authoritarianism in Iran. Um, the, the pattern of these struggles across the region shows that the incumbent um, political regime's response is extended in various forms, such as higher level of repression, as you mentioned, uh, sometimes distribution of citizenship privileged packages uh, to buy political dissidents, endorsing a discourse of promising for change, which was the case probably previously uh, prior to the election, the first round of election of Rouhani in Iran, uh, partial and selective political or societal liberalization reforms in practice or at least in rhetoric. Um, now we're moving on to our next speaker who has done extensive research on the recruitment policy and operation strategy of uh, Basij resistance force uh, in Iran. As you may all know, Basij is a volunteer paramilitary organization that operates under the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or the IRGC and acts as an auxiliary force with uh, duties such as maintaining inter internal security, law enforcement, um, special religious or political events, moral policing, and so on. Uh, it has branch branches virtually in every city and town in Iran. And um, the reason we focus on uh, the Basij uh, tonight is that uh, the organization has gained further importance following the 2009 election uh, crisis, uh, and it played a key role in heavy-handed suppression of the protests since then. Um, Ahmad's research interest is on questions such as revolution, uh, militancy and care in Iran and uh, the wider MENA region. His most recent work was focused on Iran's revolutionary politics and the state interventions in um, urban low income neighborhoods with a focus on the besiege and it will be soon published. The result of this project will be soon published by Edinburgh University. Um, Ahmed received his PhD from University of Manchester. He has done a postdoc at the School of Advanced Studies and Social Sciences in Paris. And now he is a visiting scholar 
at uh, Freie Universität in uh, Berlin. Uh, over to you, Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your generous introduction. Um, and thank you very much um, to the organizers of, the, of today's uh, session. I'm, I'm quite honored to share my uh, thoughts on, uh, on, on, on the issue of like the uprisings in the region today with you. Um, I'm going to read from my notes. I, I didn't dare to make some PowerPoints because they usually go wrong. Um, and, uh, and, and, and thank you, Azade, for detailed explanations. That helps me um, go a little bit uh, more conceptual in my, in my talk in relation to the social movements in, uh, in Iraq. A decade has passed since social movements, unprecedented in range and scale, swept across the Middle East and North Africa. My interest in the discussion on social movements in the region stems from the following arguments. The failure of most of the uprisings in, uh, in, in the region to transform the established order and the emergence of new forms of political engagement among counter-revolutionary forces pose a pressing question that has remained largely unexplored. In the, in the aftermath of a social movement, what sites of mobilization emerge for organized groups within the state apparatus? So basically, to put it simply, when a social movement fails to transform the state power, those in power get more powerful. And that's quite paradoxical. And it's quite like, and, and we have seen this in Egypt, in Libya, in, in many different uh, countries in the region. And the same goes for Iran. This question requires a shift in the studies of social movements in the Middle East and North Africa region, away from a focus on the locations of resistance and political transformations. Instead, I've, I find it important to attend to the political mobilization of pro-regime forces and focus on their struggles to, restore, to restore the political order. It is this analytical shift that informs my ethnographic choice to study the Basij, the most prominent pro-regime organization in Iran, and to examine its, its organized efforts to maintain the established order in the years following the 2009 political unrest. In the remaining time that I have, I will briefly draw on a comparative look uh, to first tease out how Arab Spring was interpreted and acted upon by politicians and the public in Iran. Next, I will explain what were the impacts of those social movements on reorganizations of domestic politics in Iran, based on my study of the passage activities in, new, uh, in, low -income poor, uh, in low income neighborhoods of Iran. The unexpected and relatively rapid revolution in Tunisia soon became the center of attention and video attention and videos of the protests started circulating on Facebook in Iran. Things will get more serious if the protests start in Egypt. In Egypt, people were impatiently telling each other. Sooner than they, than they expected, the wave of unrest hit the Egyptian political scene. The live broadcast of the, upcoming, of, of the upcoming revolution and the occupation of Tahrir Square were followed closely by the green movement activists and the Iranian media. Egypt has long been in a state of enmity with the Islamic Republic. The difficult diplomatic relationship began when uh, President Anwar Sadat allowed the deposed Shah to stay in Egypt after leaving Iran days before the 1979 revolution. Egypt and its politicians were long viewed as allies of Israel who had succumbed to Israel's expanding power in the region by signing the Camp David Accords. With the Egyptian regime on the brink of collapse, the official Iranian media were quick to dub the upheavals in Egypt, the Islamic awakening, claiming that the movements were a continuation of the 1979 revolution that Iran had always planned to export to other countries in the region. In the midst of the revolution in Egypt, the Supreme Leader delivered a sermon 
in Arabic in Tehran, addressing the Egyptian revolutionaries and called for the uprising of Muslims all over the region to stand against the tyrannies. The rise of the Muslim Brotherhood boosted the Iranian politicians' confidence in their narrative and they viewed uh, its ascendancy to power as proof that what was happening in Egypt was for sure an Islamic awakening. The uprising and the sectarian war that ensued in Libya sparked the same reaction from the Iranian authorities. And the intervention of foreign countries in Libya evidenced that the West was keen on di diverting the revolution from its genuine Islamic track. The Libyan case also gave sufficient reason for the hardliners in Iran to argue that trusting the West on the issue of nuclear dis uh, disarmament would have a devasta devastating impact on the country as it threatened to bring about a scenario of military intervention by Western countries. Even if the events in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya could loosely fit the narrative of Islamic awakening, one single country was set to upset it all, Syria. If Egypt, Libya and Tunisia never had a good relationship with Iran, Syria was a long-term ally. The peaceful protests of Syrians in Aleppo were answered with bloody confrontation from the Syrian regime. Iranian officials started propagating the claim that it was not an Islamic awakening that motivated Syrians. Instead, protesters were terrorists threatening the sovereignty of the Syrian ruling party and above all, Assad's family. Accordingly, the 2011 uprisings and the subsequent civil war in Syria were a trial of faith for Iran-Syria relations. As Iran became the primary backer of Bashar al-Assad's government, during the seven year, during a, a, a decade long Syrian civil war, much of the fighting on behalf of the Syrian regime was done by Iran's Quds Corp and other Iranian backed militia. They, they include Hezbollah in Lebanon and Shia auxiliary forces from Iraq and Afghanistan who are directly trained and funded by Iranian operatives. They, the presence of Quds Corp and pro Shia militia is purportedly, purportedly justified by the necessity to protect the holy Shia shrine of Zainab in Damascus against the destructive destructive forces of Islamic State of Iraq, of Iraq and the Levant or Daesh. Other than that, Iran sees as its help in shoring up the Syrian regime as an act of reciprocity for the diplomatic and military support it received from the Basis regime of Syria during the Iran-Iraq war in the 90s. In fact, Syria remained the only ally of Iran in the region in the 1980s while other Arab countries rallied behind the Basis regime of Saddam Hussein. Internally, the bitter fate of the Syrian uprising increasingly em emboldened the Iranian authorities in their efforts to justify the suppression of the Green Movement. Having descended into a bloody civil war, Syria set an example of how the situation would have turned out had this Green Movement continued. The rise of Daesh helped the Iranian regime to reinforce this narrative even further. When Daesh seized vast areas of Syria and Iraq, the Iranian regime went to great lengths to show uh, how Daesh posed serious threats to Iranian national borders. To, find, to fight against an Islamic group, Iranian authorities interlaced and expressions of defending true Islam with the imperative of national security. In this political climate, the sense of danger from the threats swirling around the country led many Iranians pr to prioritize security over dissent. As a friend and Green Movement activist put it, I know that the Islamic Republic is not an ideal regime, but when I watch how countries are battered by Daesh one after another, I'd rather live in a secure country even if it means I have to put aside my political demands. In this security-driven environment, it, it is clear that although Iranians have remained skeptical of the regime, they have not doubted the imperative of security.
nearly 10 years on after the Arab Spring has toppled rulers, triggered sectarian strife, civil wars, and counter-revolutionary groups, the Islamic Republic has not only survived the Green Movement, but has also boasted its ability in a volatile, its stability in a volatile region. This stability has given the Iranian authorities more opportunities to employ a constantly evolving strategy to tackle the surge of change across the neighboring countries and form new responses and strategies, namely the soft war in the Islamic Republic. So this is my entry point to the question of the passage and how, uh, and, and as Sarah explained, how it gained, has gained prominent position in the Iranian politics. So in response to perceived and external threats, soft war emerged as the guiding principle for Iranian authorities. The Basij stands at the forefront of the soft war, and it has un unfurled a series of measures to fight such a war. I would just share this, uh, my screen to show you this. So this is uh, a, temp a table I'm using in the manuscript of my book. It's a little bit old, but it needs to be updated because there are so many more institutions added to the pool. So for instance, the headquarter of the soft war, and this is responsible for identifying the soft war strategies of the enemies and psychological operations. Of course, it's, it, they sound funny, but they are real, real deals. The, the other ones are like, are like the media committee of soft war and they get their own budget. Other ones are like other, uh, other units, units in armed forces. For, for instance, Permanent Bureau for Soft War, the Specialist Center for Soft War, and so on and so forth. What I did for my research was like, I worked with the uh, different, uh, different groups and basically four groups of the Basij and, uh, and, and I observed their activities. One was, how they go, went to, uh, to low-income neighborhoods to screen films. The other one was like construction projects. They created uh, and, 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 and the, the, the passage and affiliated uh, people and, and factions that go to remote villages to build schools. And uh, the other one was like the security uh, units in uh, neighborhoods. All they did, was to gather force and to persuade people that first revolution is alive. Second, they had to observe the activities of the poor because the, the, the idea was that the poor are the true inherents of the revolution and they are true supporters of the regime. But something is quiet uh, not, has not gone quite based on plan. And as Azad explained, many of the poor are uh, protesting now. So this is a very difficult time for the Islamic Republic and for the, uh, for the groups like the Basij. On the one hand, they want to persuade the poor to support the regime. On the other hand, they don't know what to do because they are resourceless and they don't really, they cannot really justify people how they can support the state because materially speaking, it's not available to them. So I can talk about it in the Q&A, how it is tied to the, uh, to the election and how people after the 2000 election, especially the Basij, was, uh, campaigning grass, I was like guiding the grassroots campaigns in low income neighborhoods and getting ready for this, for this day, for this election, like people like Jalili getting into the election and all the rest and saying that we have programs. Thank you very much. I, I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for um, a very, very thorough presentation of uh, different strategies. And it's very useful that, to draw these comparisons and also to highlight the impact that regional event has had on social events uh, and social unrest in Iran. Um, 
And I think it what, what you said uh, in your presentation um, very much and very clearly complements what Aza the earlier mentioned on the root causes of this uh, these cycles of unrest and um, the government uh, has been suffering from years and years of uh, budget mismanagement and budget deficit and the very fact that there are all these uh, organizations that are recipients of abandoned um, government budgets uh, to conduct so, um, citizenship, citizen surveillance and, and various forms of oppression and monitoring of the behavior of, of the political dissidents is quite um, intriguing and also it's quite telling that um, how people can ultimately uh, take their um, dissatisfactions to the street. So we already have uh, some questions on Q&A uh, box here in front of me, which I'm going to uh, share it with you. But I would like to use my privilege as the chair here and ask um, a few questions before I turn to the audience. And I will start with you, um, Azadeh. Um, you talked about the changes in the nature and the root causes of unrest in Iran. Um, so I'd like to um, invite you to compare the ultimate goal and ultimate demand of the people in Iran with, uh, in comparison with those in the Arab world. Um, we all remember that there was a very famous slogan that was heard in several Arab capitals during the uprisings. Um, the people want to bring down the regime, Ashab Yurid Asqat al Nizam. This states the ultimate demand by the people quite clearly. Um, and um, you, you talked about how the structure, how participation, how demands have evolved. But I would like to bring you to today, to 3rd of June, 2020, uh, only um, days before the next presidential election. What is the people's demand today? Have, have the demands completely changed from what it was in November, 2019? Are various, various factions of the society united in their demands? You mentioned about the, um, how people feel let down from um, the, um, by the, the reformist movements or how that about you know, the loss of hope, if you will, uh, for any future um, changes delivered by, by the reformists. So where are we now? Uh, how do you see uh, the situation? How would you assess the situation today? Yes, thank you. First of all, I think it was smart of you, Ahmed, not to use PowerPoint, because as I just learned, my slide wasn't even visible. So this, these few uh, aids that I was going to use um, didn't even show up. So I apologize. Hopefully you could still uh, follow me jumping around uh, between the different protests here and there. On your question of um, comparing, you know, the ultimate goal and what's the demand of the people in, in Iran today, let me start by saying, obviously, I cannot speak of the demand of the people of Iran today, because there is no one single demand. And, and the Islamic Republic and the society in the Islamic Republic is still diverse enough to have different ideas and different um, preferences here. Obviously, not everyone in Iran wants the system toppled. And I think Ahmad has already indicated some of the concerns that we see, um, by the way, particularly in, in the middle class. But what seems to me um, to be an important point in that regard is that some of the demands that we heard in 2009 already, and actually even prior to that in student movements and other forms of protest, they have never really been been addressed, they've never really been changed. The state has been unresponsive to these demands. And this goes particularly for any form of political liberalization. And this has been a constant in, in the Islamic Republic in the past decade. So when we talk about authoritarian resilience, it's a very good example of how, how we saw that happening and consolidating in, in the Islamic Republic in the past decades. So whenever we had movements in Iran supported by parts of the population through elections, movements that we call reformists generally, they failed across the board, starting with the 90s under uh, President Khatami, where there was a lot of euphoria and excitement and hopes in the population that things would change with now having a reformist branch of political factions here. And we saw how that turned out. Nothing really um, was produced. We had the next 
wave of hope with the 2009 elections. Um, again, with the green wave excitement and people hoping that things would change. We saw how that worked out, how it was uh, put down and how people were imprisoned, how people died and how the movement slightly was either pushed back or just dis disintegrated over time. Again, we had a wave of hope with the Wuhani government, who is not himself necessarily a reformist, but who entered an alliance with the reformist faction and who came on the ticket for one of the, the nuclear agreement to provide economic freedom and economic liberalization, but who also made promises on the political liberalization front. And in the end, he didn't deliver on any of those, neither on the economic front nor on the, on the political front. Now, a major part of it is, is the systemic constraints that are at play that severely limit also the scope of the president and how he can act. Um, so I think what we've seen in a very short time of this, this Islamic Republic being in place, which is roughly four decades, already we had ups and downs of hopes and movements and people being willing to support new presidents, being willing to stand behind new movements in the hope for change. And I think this is, this is what has fundamentally changed. What used to be a, at least a mobilizing base for the reformists doesn't seem to be there anymore with the current demographic setup. These things might change again in 10 to 15 years. But I think we see now that a lot of people have finally come to the conclusion that voting doesn't make any difference anymore. That thinking that through reformists, having people in the government, that movements could be made, that there would be less human rights violations, that there would be less securitization, that there would be less um, re repression and there would be more political freedoms, didn't materialize and doesn't seem to be the path forward. Now, not everybody who took to the streets essentially wanted regime change. And I think Ahmad made this point, this is a very important point on this fear of civil war in Iran and the fear of, particularly after the Arab Spring, this cautionary tale that was partly, of course, also um, used by the Islamic Republic, by the state apparatus to, to intimidate people. But it was effective because people were worried. They don't want a lot of people don't want Iran to turn into Syria. They don't want Iran to be the next Libya. They don't want Iran to turn into chaos, which is a sentiment that we see largely with the middle class here. So the question now is, and that's the big question, the conundrum that we're in now, if you're not necessarily having a major backup for maybe a more fundamental push for system, systematic change, and you have given up on elections as a tool of, for change, what is actually left? And I think this is the volatile state of uncertainty that we are entering now that is highly complex, highly, I think, unstable, and, and, and maybe to a little bit extent, I have to be open here, unpredictable. Thank you very much, Azadeh, uh, for your answers. And um, you nicely answered the first question I have on my screen in front of me that um, one of the audience asked, uh, why is the turnout in the election to expect it to be low? So um, the l lack of hope in the potential for change in any uh, elected presidents within the establishment is basically um, the, the reason behind the law participation. Uh, Ahmed, I would like to now uh, move on to you and ask a question um, and invite you to draw some parallels and comparison between Iran and, and the uh, experience of Arab uprising. You talked about the recruitment of supporters by the regime, which in many respects is similar to methods used in many other countries in the region where political loyalty is gained in exchange for certain privileges and perks. Um, I would like to bring another angle to this, and it's um, about framing dissidents from um, uh, po political dissidents and um, representing political dissidents and, and prosecute them for uh, non-political crimes, such as destroying public goods, disturbing the public order. And I think Azadeh has touched upon this um, um, by when she mentioned that um, the narrative that was used by the um, establishment was very similar to that of the Arab countries in the sense that um, the labeling strategy that was used to present the, um, the political demonstrators as this uh, spies of foreign powers or being influenced by, by the enemies, quote unquote. Um, 
Um, so um, this method has, has been extensively used by regimes across the, the region. Um, I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on this. Has there been similar patterns in Iran? Did you come across cases in which demonstrators were prosecuted as non-political crimes to divert the domestic and international attentions from, from the real issues? Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for the question. Um, um, what I'm thinking about, like this is uh, partly, it, it has to do with criminalization of the poor. And it did happen, like the hooligans, so the police, like a while ago, police arrested some uh, called hooligans in the neighborhoods and then started just like showing them and, and, and on the streets. So that was, of course, like a campaign to intimidate people and, and, and showing that, okay, so there is no political dissent. Let's just root out the, uh, the social uh, what they call the pathologies of the social. This is uh, one angle to look at it, like labeling strategies. But something that I witnessed, and, and that really uh, made me think about the co complexity of politics in Iran, is that when I was doing the ethnographic work in the, uh, so I was like going and, and living in poor neighborhoods. I was like talking to these people, to the to the besiege and, and all the rest of it. What was interesting for me was like how they openly criticized the state. They were quite like open to in, in their criticism. And what I witnessed was this. So it was like a, a very organized, like very organized campaigns against the uh, the uh, the activities of the Rouhani government. So what we can do, and in, in terms of this, like uh, in, in terms of analysis, was this: like the Basij and supporters of the regime, they believe in the Islamic Republic as a state. So and they call it Nizam. So this is back to your question, like Iskat Nizam, exactly this word, and they use it. So they want to support. Dinism, but they are against every single aspect of the government. They believe that it is corrupted. They believe that uh, it's, it's systematically ignoring the poor. So what happens there when the Basij is in those neighborhoods, they don't really need to label the poor. The Basij is doing that. And that's interesting for me in connection and in relation to this election, because reformers could always occupy the power in the government. And we could have like the, these frictions that um, has helped a lot the survival of this, the Islamic Republic. But what happens when it, the Islamic Republic moves towards unification? That is a very important question, and it has never experienced this only in the first decade of the Islamic Republic. So the question now is, who are the Basijis going to criticize for the fall, the, the, the corruption, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the fact that the poor do not, are not better off in a revolutionary state and all the rest of it? So that would be a very important question. And, and I think this is a strategy that needs, I, I, I am just surprised. And I'm just like looking forward to this event because this sh will show and reveal something quite significant in the Islamic Republic. So in terms of like authoritarian uh, 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 resilience, Islamic Republic survived on tensions and contentions and all the rest of it from within the power. What would happen next when it, it moves towards unification? I have no idea. And this is something that I'm quite surprised and interested in seeing in the, in the, on, uh, in the coming days. Thank you. Um, the experience of um, this ex election, the upcoming election, I think proves that um, the stronger element of the establishment, the ones that have the snipers in the streets and they have the money to invest in all of those activities are less interested in uh, that national unity. I think 
um, the um, social and political bomb is ticking. Uh, and establishment is sadly missing that opportunity. And I say that because, I mean, feel free to disagree with me, but um, I say that because the result of the vetting that was published by the Guardian Council shows that um, there is absolutely no interest in involving um, other factions into um, the... Um, the decision, this, the senior level decision makings in in the country, and that sort of uh, takes me to one of the questions that the audience asked: that is a democratic election with um, accepted takeover of the opposition even in imaginable? I mean, my answer to that question is no. Um, I would like to um, now ask a question to both of you. Um, and that is, um, again, to draw some parallels and comparisons um, and make yet another brave prediction about um, Iran. The experience of movement-led reforms in MENA region shows that reform may or may not have systemic, systematic um, implications, but does, necessarily, does not necessarily lead to change of regime. Uh, as you mentioned, not everybody wants a change of re the regime anyways. Uh, and obviously in the case of uh, Iran, this has not uh, been the outcome of about one decade of um, relatively frequent uh, cycles of uprising. Transition, however, is a term that is often used in this context, and it's always it always refers to systemic change of political regimes as opposed to change in the political system. Anyways, in the GCC, in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, um, the governments use the Arab uprising failures, which you also mentioned that. Um, the example of Syria was very much adopted into the official narrative uh, by, by the states. And um, what the GCC did was that they combined this with promise for reform. For example, um, Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Zayed, they used the narrative of a new leader, new era, new approach um, by promising to make things better. Uh, some say that this was just a strategy to buy more time. Uh, some say that they need to make some changes. They need to implement some changes because change is inevitable and the governments of the GCC will have to offer some, some degree of change sooner rather than later. Now, we have a new president coming into office in Tehran in August. Um, I would like to ask you both, what do you predict um, after the next election? Um, what are we likely to see in Iran? More suppression, more social consolidation, um, empty promise for change, real change? So who would like to go first? <laughs> you decide oh, between the two. <laughs> I think Azada was always first, so you can you can you can go on. Sure. Um, maybe I can combine it with where Ahmad left things, because I think that's such an interesting point of discussion that I wouldn't want to lose that one on which direction we are taking with regard to unification and stuff like this. But maybe for people to have a better understanding, let me just quickly say what is maybe so, let's say a little bit different in these elections than what we are used from the Islamic Republic. So the Islamic Republic has always selected the kind of candidates beforehand. Uh, that would be the Guardian Council um, would do that um, and decide that let's say six or seven people out of hundreds of people who would register to run for presidency would be allowed to run. And there was this sort of principle for a long time that while the system selects the candidates, the people select the winner. And already in 2009, we see the system gravely kind of violating this principle.
um, with interfering in the election result. What we see this time around is another step into that direction. This is the time where we see the selection already, which has always been very limited. Obviously, only people are selected who are within the framework of the Islamic Republic, who are already not oppositional figures per se, of course. But this time, the selection has been particularly limiting. And we almost have entirely a setup that makes it very, very likely for one particular person to win the presidency. And this is even by the regular standards of the Islamic Republic, unusual. And that person is Ibrahim Raisi. And the, the question here is why have they decided to do so? And I think it's one point that we need to bear in mind that Raisi, who is, uh, has been the chief of the judiciary um, and who has been for some time rumored to be a potential successor to the Supreme Leader, has now, if he wins these elections, a very good chance and is in a very good position to actually becoming the, the next Supreme Leader. Khamenei is 82 years old. There's a good chance that his death might fall into the next presidency or the second presidential cycle. Usually presidents in Iran who are in four year cycle get reelected. So in the next upcoming years, the likelihood of him being president in, in the time of the death of the Supreme Leader when the question of succession of in the Islamic Republic, which is a very significant one, as we all know in autocratic systems, the question of succession will be there. And Raisi is probably be going to be in the position. So we're not just talking about presidential elections here. We're potentially talking about having the power for decades to come on the most powerful um, institution in the state, much more important than a presidency. So this is what is at stake. I think somebody asked, is nothing at stake here? There's something at stake here, but I still believe it probably won't be enough for people to get to the ballot boxes because they think this, this thing is over anyways. They're going to put Raisi in there. This is the general perception. They're going to put Raisi in there and he's potentially in the best position to become the next Supreme Leader. Obviously, we don't know if that's true. And I think Ahmed has already indicated, and I cannot stress this enough, Islamic Republic, it's such a dynamic system. We've seen so many surprises in the past, so many unexpected things, even elections. So I'm really worried, you know, I don't want to make predictions here, but I'm saying that this is the kind of context that we're talking about right now when we look at these elections and why they are so sensitive. And here I want to add to what Ahmad has said about this kind of, what would it look like if we had a unified position? In a way we had this before. I mean, right now the conservative principalists are dominating the parliament. They're dominating the judiciary. They're dominating the guardian council and they're likely to, very likely to take over the executive as well. The last time we had this kind of unified factional position was under Ahmadinejad. And that was the time of the most intense political infighting that we've seen, the time of the green movement where the system was on the brink of collapse, which is why I fully agree with what you said, Ahmad. I think this is a highly volatile situation ahead of us. So sort of to your question, I don't expect this to be a time of liberalization, a time of, you know, um, tensions easing. I see the contrary. I see the time of intense factional infighting, which will change from the previous conflict lines between reformists and principalists and be entirely and mostly within the conservative camp where the infighting will now take place. And it's probably going to be severe because it's about more than presidency, the presidency at this point. It's about having the major power in the Islamic Republic for decades to come. Ahmed, would you like to add something to that? Thank you. Thank you. Azad. This is that was very, uh, very complete. Um, I, I just want to add something. So, of course, like I, I guess, uh, as uh, Azad did, rightly pointed out, the question is succession is not only like taking over an executive power, so that that branch is it's it's the question of succession and guaranteeing that uh, the Islamic Republic would outlive uh, the death of the Supreme Leader. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, and emphasize what Azadi was saying that political infighting, and this is something that is likely to happen. For some time in the beginning, of course, they would uh, like people, uh, like hardliners, would be happy uh, in power. But what would come is like the political infighting, and this is inevitable because it's uh, they have to re. Uh, rehold the whole system. Otherwise, uh, they would have this like uh, political infighting. And, and what would happen, and uh, uh, this um, scholar of Iran, Nikki Kedi, says something, and I, and I love this sentence. The state in Iran runs fast to stay in place. 
And I think this is quite like telling of the situation in Iran. They make and they have to make so many promises and they constantly fail. And they are the engine of tensions in Iran. It's not like people are doing something extraordinary. They built their uh, dissatisfaction on the promises that they receive on a daily basis in poor neighborhoods, in the, their families, on TV and all the rest of it, from the banks, from the, uh, the, the stock market and all the rest of it. So in, in basically the Islamic Republic is the engine of contention. And, and that's like something that is perhaps making it different from other authoritarian states in the region. I'm not really sure about that. But the fact that it calls itself a revolutionary state, which is an oxymoron, is very important. And they, uh, it, it, normally they follow revolutionary politics, which means you have to support the poor uh, and, and, and you have to establish social justice and all the rest of it. So basically, and, and, I, uh, and, and I completely agree with Azadeh that this is likely to happen by like political infighting and we will have more protests in Iran. Thank you very much. And that's perhaps the reason that we um, sometimes hear about uh, plans for uh, changing the constitution to completely eradicate the role of presidency, to, to make things easier and make that transition ultimately, as Azadeh rightly mentioned, easier, because that transition would be inevitable at some point um, during the next president. And, and it's it's really interesting that um, when since the vetting result was published, we don't really talk about the next president, we talk about Raisi, we all are, you know, the, the results are, are, are there. Uh, but as you rightly mentioned, the Islamic Republic is the country, uh, the, a, a regime of uh, surprises. So we might also be surprised by the result ultimately, but we shall see. Um, you mentioned, um, Ahmed, something about uh, this importance of security for the people, which is absolutely correct. I couldn't agree with you more. But at the same time, the deterioration of economic um, conditions in Iran have led to a significant increase in uh, crime, theft, mobile snatching, you name it. Um, and what I'm hearing basically these days from the people who are living in Iran, and I've, I've written recently a short article on that that was published by the Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington, um, is that people now are not afraid of the establishment or a civil war in, in the shape that happened in Syria, but they are worried of becoming the next Venezuela. Uh, you know, in which the the um, businesses and uh, peoples and houses and tourist resorts are being um, attacked by mobs and 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 by thieves. And so, although the ultimate uh, desired outcome was to maintain the security, and, and that was very. Um, conveniently adopted by the establishment into the narrative of the regime. The, the result, however, is that the establishment even failed in delivering that stability and that security at the domestic level. And that also adds another dimension to what you both have mentioned, the, um, you know, the outlook of uh, more intensity and, and problematic environments um, in Iran. We have two questions um, by the audience asking about the impact of external factors. Uh, one question specifically asked about the regional um, factors, um, specifically about Israel, and one question is about um, the US. So would you like to pick one each and answer that? How do you assess the role and the policies of external powers on the establishments, the strategies domestically, and perhaps in respect to um, responding to this, um, the um, political unrest. So this time, maybe let's go in reverse order. Ahmed, you go first. You can. You have the luxury of picking and choosing whichever one you want. Uh, 
Uh, thanks. Um, I guess Azad uh, prepared something about the, the sanctions, and, and, I, and I guess um, I will leave the question of America and the US to her. And, and, and so about Israel, I'm not an expert in Israel, but I can only say and talk about the imaginaries. So how politics is the space of imagination too. And in connection to what you said about like, uh, like just very shortly about the security, the question of security, and they uh, are likely to change constantly. So uh, the question of security was very, very pertinent for the Iranian public when Daesh was around. Now, that they are uh, witnessing and feeling the, the economic insecurity, they don't really uh, care much about that, that kind of national security and all the rest of it. So um, they have moved on, I guess. So their imagination is like, they might become next North Korea and Venezuela at the same time. And in the best case scenario, they would be China. So it's just like they, the narratives move and that's just the kind of atmosphere that is there. So, and, and about Israel, and I guess Israel, again, is, is quite interesting case in case of, in, in terms of imagination. Israel bombarded Syria when, uh, when Hafez Assad was uh, like wanted to develop uh, nuclear uh, plants in Syria and Israel stopped that. Probably Iranians have the same feeling that Israel has, has gained a lot of power. And in the region, due to its security, its uh, military advancement, and all the rest of it, and no country could contribute to that imagination of power than the Islamic Republic, unfortunately. Uh, that's uh, because they planted and and successfully uh, implemented different attacks on Iran and and Israel, and, and many people. Israel, of course, didn't uh, claim it. Uh, and publicly announce it, but uh, many people are believe like believe that Israel was behind the attacks and completely uh, humiliated the Islamic Republic and of course the security factions of the Islamic Republic. So Israel, of course, is playing a, a, a role in in the, uh, in the in the internal polity of the Islamic Republic, but the extent to which they can be successful in changing the direction of the uh, nuclear deal and, and the negotiations, I'm not really sure they are. They would be that successful because uh, the Iranian politicians are quite smart in that in that regard. I, I would say, and I guess that would be something that Azad can explain more. Thanks. Thank you very much, Azad. Over to you. Yes, just a couple of points. I think in terms of what we see happening in the region, particularly between Iran and, and Israel. We are actually seeing a shadow war that has gotten out of the shadows for quite some time now. I mean, we have uh, cyber attacks going back and forth constantly. We have um, assassinations um, of nuclear scientists. Um, we have the United States targeting uh, Rossem Soleimani, the commander of the Quds forces, killing him essentially in Iraq, another assassination, if you will. Um, we have attacks on critical infrastructure like nuclear sites in Natanz. Uh, we constantly have attacks and, and acts of sabotage on tanks, on oil facilities. So if you look at these past two years alone, you will see how the dynamics in the region have changed. And it has, particularly around the Persian Gulf, become much less secure. And this has certainly indirectly contributed to this heightened sense of um, fear within the security apparatus in Iran and, and this alert situation that they're in. And it has contributed to the further securitization of the domestic sphere as well. There's one big um, kind of fear that is all present, omnipresent, or at least used as a fear, and that's the fear of infiltration that we are constantly used by the security forces, uh, forces that the Islamic Republic is being infiltrated by foreign agents, that dual nationals have been more severely targeted, even foreign nationals now being targeted um, and put in, 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 in prison uh, for spying charges, constantly security forces coming forward saying they have dissolved in, in the latest spy network. So this has contributed to the sense of insecurity. And it is on the one hand also natural given the kind of attacks going back and forth that we see on all sides, obviously Iran also carrying out cyber attacks and acts of sabotage in the Persian Gulf. 
Um, so this had a fundamental effect here on, on, on the whole domestic environment and how things are felt um, also for, for the people there. Um, one thing that I want to add to that with regard to the role of sanctions, which um, Ahmad has indicated, I originally wanted to incorporate in my presentation, didn't have time. Um, I think somebody asked if, if there's a chance the United States would lift some of these sanctions. Let me start by saying why I think in what way sanctions have affected the social sphere in Iran very briefly, because I think this, the kind of sanctions that we saw applied on the um, Donald Trump under this maximum pressure policy were not just targeted sanctions, there were broad sectoral sanctions that targeted nearly every critical sector of the Iranian economy, Iran's banking relations, financial relations, oil, gas, oil energy exports, automobile industry, so many different sectors, um, which had a huge impact, obviously, on how Iran could even conduct any kind of trade of in business, um, particularly even in the field of humanitarian trade, by the way, when it came to importing pharmaceuticals and medicine, huge problem in COVID-19, but maybe we, we come to that later on. And these sanctions had a significant effect also indirectly again on the social, uh, on the social sphere in the sense that it had severely weakened the Iranian middle class. And if you think about um, the middle class in Iran being essentially the backbone of civil society and civic action, it has been highly counterproductive when it comes to Iranian citizens actually taking counteraction. I should just give you an example. Through high inflation and the devaluation of the Iranian real, many uh, parts, particularly of the middle class, have seen their assets erode before their eyes. They had way less means to, to participate. And this had an effect on the kind of activities that they conduct, could conduct, not only because prices exploded, the price for paper, for instance, if you want to have publishing um, move forward, but also in the sense that you had human rights defenders not being able to work pro bono anymore, people who had to take care of their own financial well-being and not being able to put their time and efforts to work for free to defend others and do something. These are just some examples in which the sanctions actually had a limiting effect on the capabilities of people on the ground. I think they have been devastating and a huge, huge mistake from a geopolitical point of view, from a humanitarian point of view, and from the point of view of any form of pro political transition that you would actually want to have and wish for. Lastly, will the US lift sanctions? Yes, we're very close to the United States actually suspending some of the sanctions that have been um, inconsistent with the implementation of the nuclear agreement. There are currently talks going on in Vienna. I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see some sort of conclusion in the upcoming weeks, but I think uh, most likely under the still under this uh, government before the new government will take over. And this will include the uh, suspension of a number of sanctions, um, and it will hopefully also provide some breathing space for, for Iran's not only middle class, but also low income households. Thank you very much. Yes, the question of, um, medical supplies and healthcare supplies is, is something that um, I have been asked um, very frequently over the past few years. And um, people often tend to think that the United States doesn't have any sanctions on humanitarian aid and why Iran is suffering from this. But what is uh, missing in this story, um, especially covered by the media, is that in reality, what the sanctions have done is that they contributed towards a significant uh, decline of the government uh, foreign currency revenue because the government cannot through through the official channels export hydrocarbon resources therefore the amount of dollar based or other foreign currency based revenue that the government has been generating prior to these sanctions have declined significantly so that has contributed directly towards the decline of the national currency uh, which means uh, on one hand the government is trying to share its budget deficit with the people by borrowing from the central bank reserves, which do not exist, which means printing money and circulating liquidity into the economy. And on the other hand, um, by devaluating the, the, the national currency, the government is trying to maintain its real equivalent of the foreign exchange revenues relatively stable to be able to um, meet the obligations, financial obligations. So as a result of this, 
uh, not only all the products for the Iranian consumers are all ultimately a lot more expensive than they were before. People simply cannot afford to buy medicine, even if it's available. But also this system combined with the extremely corrupt system that exists for distribution of foreign currency inside Iran through the central bank has contributed into this vicious cycle in which um, those who receive uh, specifically allocated foreign currency by the central bank, i.e. Iranian traders to import uh, medical supply, they do not deliver uh, in their obligations and most of the money is simply just evaporating out of, out of the official system without actually um, being used for any um, useful um, purpose. And this is um, sort of the, the reason that we keep saying that the uh, sanctions are putting a pressure on humanitarian aspects of um, people's lives inside Iran. Um, you mentioned also there's something about um, the increase of suppression by the establishment on dual citizens, foreign citizens, activists, and so on and so forth. And there is also a question about the role of NGOs and how, how powerful they are, how meaningful they are, how much change they can, they can um, make. Um, I, I find that um, quite intriguing because I don't know about you, but I lived in Iran under um, Khatami's time. And um, there was one particular occasion that in the city where you're based in, there was a conference held called the very famous, Im infamous Berlin conference in which several human rights activists, including Shirin Ebadi, Mehrangiz Kar, all live in exile now, attended that conference and they went back to the country to face severe punishment for simply just attending a conference in, in Berlin. Um, so. I, I'm not quite sure how how much difference do you think these sanctions have made the environment for for human rights activists. Um, it has always been, in my opinion, quite challenging environment. There has never been a moment in which people were um, allowed to conduct research without being labelled as the spies of Zionists or being under pressure. Um, so, on, on on that note, if um, I'd like to. Uh, hear your 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 um, thoughts on that, and also generally speaking, if um, you both have um, any um, points to make about the NGOs, the human rights activists, where do they fit in this? You mentioned about um, the pro bono work, and and I I do believe that people who were willing to work voluntarily. Um, to defend human rights activists and defend um, uh, political prisoners or ideological prisoners, Baha'is, university activists, you name it. There are, you know, Kurds, uh, Baluchis, there are hundreds of different um, uh, groups that are prosecuted inside the system. Um, the reason that, and this is before before the sanctions, the reason that they found it challenging to find defenders was not economic reasons, it was the state's pressure. It was the government's intimidating methods trying to prevent human rights lawyers to protect these voices that can do are you know are defenseless. Um, so what 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 are you? I mean, you both. Uh, I would just give the each of you maybe three four minutes to wrap up, and if you have any five, um, points to make on these uh, questions, thank you. Yeah, actually, I mean, since we don't have much time, and I actually wanted to answer some questions from the chat, some more questions. So it's a little bit, um, it's a pity that we didn't have that much time for it. But uh, to make it quick on, on what you said, um, when I talk about the effect of sanctions, I'm talking about sanctions um, having a negative effect in a sense that they worsen an already bad situation. Sanctions are not the root cause of problems in Iran for civil society. They are not the root cause for human rights violations. They are not the root cause of economic woes in Iran, but they have exacerbated already existing problems. And the case of the human rights defenders is actually something that is 
uh, being reported by human rights activists that this is a problem. And it's, this doesn't say that the state is not a problem or even a bigger problem, not at all. But it is saying that sanctions have actually made things more difficult. So as external actors, if we are not able to support civil society, at least we should not stand in the way of it. At least we should not make the conditions under which they work even more difficult. So instead of relieving pressure, we have added to already existing pressure. That's the negative side of, of the sanctions. On the COVID-19, uh, COVID I think the main point here that I wanted to make about humanitarian trade, yes, there's an explosion of costs, there's corruption in Iran in, in the medical sphere, no doubt about it. But there are very logistical, practical problems here with medicals um, and medicine even reaching Iran. Humanitarian trade based on international laws actually exempt um, from sanctions. And the United States has not sanctioned humanitarian trade. The problem with broad sectoral sanctions that we saw under the maximum pressure policy was that it sanctioned so many different sectors that are essential for moving an, a good from A to B that it was essentially impossible. So if you were a German company trying to export pharmaceuticals to Iran, you would have difficulties finding an insurance company to insurance the goods. You would have difficulties finding a delivery company to deliver the goods. You would have find difficulties finding a bank that would finance finance the transition and the transaction. These are very practical major obstacles that stand in the way even of basic humanitarian goods like pharmaceuticals, medicine and food reaching Iran. Completely separate from all the problems that are already existing in Iran. That's the point that I wanted to make. And I think it's important to bear that in mind and to push back against these kind of sanctions. We saw that in the case of Iraq, we were supposed to learn from our mistakes on the international arena. We didn't learn enough. and I'm. But really sorry to say that we have only made matters much, much worse for many Iranians um, on the ground. Thank you, Azadeh. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you, Azadeh. I guess Azadeh talks very completely and comprehensively, so I, I, I don't really have much to say about the, the role of sanctions. And, and the only thing I, I have to say is that to second what Azadeh said, that it, 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 sanctions exacerbated the bad situation in Iran and, and, and basically cut off the, uh, not, not the only the state from uh, accessing the uh, resources, but the ordinary people too. Um, like just, just to personalize it a little bit, it's just like I had to send something uh, via mail. So even post doesn't work. So this is like, it's quite bad. So the effect is, is just like, even for, it's not only for the government, it's for the ordinary people. And, and, and I can't really, it's been like, I've, I've been waiting for three months to get my uh, birth certificates from Iran and I can't find. So this is something uh, quite humiliating, not only, uh, and it's punishment. So it's, it's a kind of pun collective punishment we are going through. But the, 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 the difficulty now is that even if the sanctions would be lifted, the fruit of that would be in the hands of Raisi. So this is too late. Uh, and and, and, and the, uh, the government in the US basically is, is doing something quite late. And, and of course, the, the situation would be better. But just imagine that Raisi would be the, the president and would say like, okay, we have like, look, we have improved the economy for the people, so we are better. So that's just like, it's, it's, it's helping the, uh, the, the, the populist discourse in Iran, of course. It's, we, we cannot be, uh, uh, we have to look at the ground and how it would unfold uh, the sanctions and the lifting of sanctions and its temporality. So maybe three months ago, maybe before the election, lifting of sanctions would have effect. Now it's just like, I don't know. I, and I have no idea. It's, we, uh, sometimes we hold on to a romantic uh, the argument, but we have to look at the temporalities of the situation. Maybe it's too late. And I have no, I don't know. And, and that's just something that we have to consider. This is what I'm, what I'm saying. 
Thank you so much to you both. I think in order to keep the flow of conversation relatively smooth, I uh, try to, I mean, we, we covered a good number of questions, Azad, don't, don't be too disappointed. Uh, we, I try to um, pick and choose uh, questions that would contribute towards a smoother flow of conversations. Thank you very much to you both. Thank you so much to the audience. We have two minutes left. I would like to give you one minute each. Is there any particular point that you would like like to raise and you think you did not get a chance to, to do so? I guess I would just end with the, uh, with the, uh, with the question of hope. When uh, we are facing a very difficult situation in Iran, both in terms of sanctions, both in terms of like solidification of power in Iran, and, and probably hope is something that, and it is inherent in our culture. So we, uh, we will hold on to it. But sometimes I, rem I am just reminded of what Walter Benjamin said, that hope is invented for the hopeless people. So I'm just oscillating between these two faces. Thank you very much for listening and, 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 and thanks for all the questions. Yes, thank you very much. That was such a beautiful final statement that I want to ruin, I don't want to ruin it with another one. So thank you all for taking part in this discussion. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye.